Good evening. It's a blessing to be here with you once again. And I know you have your Bibles with you. So before we get into the Word of God, it is a week of prayer. We cannot pray too often, can we? And so I want to invite you, as I told you last evening, every time before I, I open the Word of God, I like to invite the people of God to pray. So let's just spend the next 60 seconds in silent prayer. I'm going to kneel. I invite you to do likewise, just 60 seconds. And then when you hear my voice, I'll close us out in prayer. Let us ask for the gift of the Spirit of God. Father in heaven, Lord God of the universe, again we want to praise your name this evening because you are worthy to be praised. You declared in your word, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more would you, our Father which is in heaven, give the Holy Spirit unto them that ask? And so, Lord, we're asking for the Holy Spirit. We're asking that you would fit us to be recipients of the full outpouring of your presence. Please, wash our hearts clean of anything that would present itself as an obstacle from us fully realizing oneness with thee and with your son, Jesus Christ. Bless our understanding of your word this evening. May it have a sanctifying influence upon our lives. Thank you for hearing these prayers. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In Jesus' name we all do pray. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to open your Bibles. We're going to go to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to begin at verse 48. This is a familiar scripture, I believe, to most of us here. And we're going to deal with the subject matter that unfortunately is controversial within the church of the living God. It's, a, it's controversial within all Christendom, and it should not be controversial within God's remnant movement, if you will. But unfortunately, nonetheless, it is. But let's see what the Word of God has to say about the subject matter. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48, Jesus declared, Be ye therefore... Are you there with me in your Bibles? Yeah. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. The Word of God is very clear. Jesus Christ is calling each and every one of us to experience perfection. But unfortunately, as I stated earlier, this is a controversial subject in the church, is it not? Yeah. There are so many that say no one can be perfect, no one is perfect. Well, before we go any further, did Jesus call us to perfection? Yes. Yes. If God calls us to experience perfection, then he expects for us to experience perfection. And I love the reality that all of God's biddings are his enablings. Amen? Amen. And I believe one of the reasons why people find this subject to be so controversial is because we superimpose or we put our own definition of what perfection is on the Word of God. You know, if you think perfection is never getting a math problem wrong, always having your shoelaces tied, you, you, you get where I'm going with this, then, then of course we have a problem here. But that is not the perfection that the Word of God is speaking of. That word perfect in the original language, I love it. It has a few different definitions. One of it, one of the definitions means to be mature. One of the definitions is to be mature. Another one is to be complete. Another one is to be ripe. You like these definitions? The one that I find the most interesting is the word perfect is also defined as man. 
Man, M-A-N, man. And I like that definition because when we understand what God's definition of a man is, then we begin to understand what God's understanding of perfection is for you and I. In the book of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, you know this scripture, but turn your Bibles there. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. The Bible gives us a definition of a man. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1. What verse are you looking for in your Bibles? The Bible tells us there. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. According to the Bible, a man, meaning mankind, if you will, is one that was made in the image of God. So when God is calling us to perfection, he's calling us to be restored back into his original intention in creating us, and that is to reveal his image. God is calling us to be restored back into his image. That's perfection. Amen? Amen? So when we are fully matured, when we come to a state of completion in the will of God, we will, re we will be restored back into the image of God. Amen. Friends, this is exactly what the Bible says. If you go with me, go with me in your Bibles. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Let's look at the 13th verse. Because in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13, a chapter in the Bible, by the way, which speaks of the gifts of the Spirit. In verse 13, the Bible tells us the ultimate design for which God has placed the gifts of his Spirit in the church. Are you there with me in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13? It says, Till we all come into the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, look at the next part, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Do you see development there? Do you see maturity there? Till we come to the measure, the stature of the fullness of Christ. Christ. So to be perfect means that we will have characters that will resemble the very character of Jesus himself. And we don't obtain to this by ourselves because as much as we work, as much as we do anything that we could possibly do within our human power, we can never obtain to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ in our own ability. But look what the Bible says. Go with me to the book of Colossians chapter 2 now. Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to look at the 10th verse. In Colossians chapter 2, it speaks of Jesus Christ. In verse 9, it talks about that in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then this very Jesus, in whom all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily, the scripture goes on to say in verse 10 of Colossians chapter 2, if you're there, say amen. It says, and ye are complete in him who is the head of all principalities and powers. So how do we come to this state of completeness? By our lives being hidden in Christ. Christ in me, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's exactly what the Bible tells us. I want you to look at this. It's right there in the Bible, right there in Colossians again. Look at chapter 1, verse 27. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27, it tells us there, to whom God would make known the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, Christ in me, the hope of glory. And we will learn this week that that word glory is synonymous. It's one and the same with character. One and the same. So we can obtain to being perfect. We can obtain to being complete. We can mature back into what God ordained that we be. And that is intelligent beings that are perfect reflections of the image of God, and it is all possible in Jesus. Friends, if it is not possible for us to be perfect, then that means Jesus is impotent. 
If we can't be perfect, then God can't fulfill his word. And what did we talk about last night? God's word is pure. Everything he says is true. Whatever he declares, even if, even if it's never been seen before, he can do it. So even though you may be a rascal, God can make you perfect. There may not have been one bit of righteousness ever revealed in your life, but if you surrender your heart to Christ and allow him to come in and make you complete, you can be what he ordained for you to be, and that is perfect. Either God has the power or he doesn't. So when people have this contention about whether or not man can be perfect, what are they really talking about? They're contesting the power of God. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, since when did the plan of salvation have anything to do with what men can do? The plan of salvation hinges on the power of God and his ability to do We love to say, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. <laughs> we'll, they'll say it before basketball games, football games, before you got a test, boy. We do all things. But as soon as it comes to being perfect, it's all things except for that one thing. You know, brothers and sisters, they, they say you're not supposed to define a word with a word. But all means all. <laughs> There's nothing exempt. So there's no question in my mind from the Bible as to whether or not we can be perfect. The question that we should have in our minds and what's settled in our minds is how do we obtain to it? How is it accomplished? How is this work done in our lives? That's the question we should be considering, and that's what we should be praying to experience. Let's go to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 17. It's one of my favorite places in the Bible to look about this. It look, look, well, actually, to study this issue concerning perfection. And as we go to the book of Genesis chapter 17, we begin to realize that this whole thing of God calling us to perfection, it's not a new thing. It's not a New Testament thing, if you will. It's from the, bio, it's from the very beginning. From the very beginning. We know Abram as the father of the faithful. Am I right? Okay, well, look at Genesis 17 and verse 1. The Bible says, And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. This is Genesis chapter 17, friends. Father of the faithful. And when he was 99 years old, even before God called him Abraham, he's still Abram. Still Abram. He's getting ready to be called Abraham, but he's still Abram at this point. God says, walk before me and be thou perfect. I want you to consider something. There are many titles in the Bible that we will find that identifies God. Like when Moses was getting ready to go to deliver the children of Israel, if you will, out of captivity. He said, well, who, what God should I tell them sent me? He said, tell them I am. Tell them I am, I am that I am. We, we see many different titles that God has in the Bible. Am I correct? Jehovah, we can go through a whole host of them. But interestingly enough, here in Genesis 17 and verse 1, God doesn't introduce himself to Abram as the I am or Jehovah. He says, I'm the almighty God. Why does God introduce himself as the almighty God when he has a host of titles that he could use? There's a reason. And it's a very easily understood reason. I want, I want to give you a quick uh, analogy, if you will. Let's say that you were sitting at home in dire straits. You know, there's no money in the bank account. You have no friends. There's no food in the refrigerator. The light's getting ready to get cut off. This is a bad situation. There's no job. You don't even have any skills or educational qualifications to get that next job. 
You're in a bad situation right now, but your cell phone is working. I don't know how people's cell phones are still working, but they're working. All right. And let's say you're there, and all of a sudden, you get a phone call. And let's say the phone call is from, let's say it's from, you ever heard of this guy called Mark Zuckerberg before? He's the owner of Facebook. Okay, so you've heard of Facebook. So, Mark Zuckerberg calls, and you know it's Mark Zuckerberg because the caller ID says it's the real Mark Zuckerberg. And you pick up and, it says, and, and he says to you, you know what, I was on Facebook today and I saw your Facebook page and I like your face. And uh, you know what? I want to take you on as my personal assistant and I want to train you so that you can be as successful of a businessman as I am. I'm going to send my personal car to your house tomorrow. Be prepared, we begin. He hangs the phone up. How would you feel? I tell you right now, you wouldn't be feeling the way that you're acting right now. <laughs> yeah. You'd be excited. Some furniture might get moved in the house, am I right? And why would you be excited? Would you be excited because all of a sudden the amount of money in your bank account changed? No. Are the lights still getting ready to get cut off? Yeah. Are you still lacking that education? Yes. Why are you excited? The only reason you're excited is because of the individual that contacted you. And you're excited because of the individual that contacted you because you know that that individual not only is successful, but they also have the resources to make you just as successful as they are as well. So when God calls Abraham and says, walk before me and be thou perfect, the first thing he says, I'm the almighty God. What's he trying to let Abraham know? Do you know who you're talking to? Do you know who's talking to you? I am all powerful. And I have the resources to give, the, give you the power to do anything I call you to do. The way that God introduces himself to Abram is assurance that he can actually accomplish what God is requesting of him. Friends, almighty means all powerful. <laughs> do we save our all-powerful God today? I can do all things through who strengthens me because he is the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Friends, look at the position where he's calling Abram to walk. Abram to walk. He didn't say, follow me. He didn't say, walk side by side with me. He said, walk before me. He's calling a 99-year-old man to conduct himself like a child. You don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, I have a daughter. Her name is Heaven. When she began making those movements, and you know how it is when you have children, and you know, okay, I think they're ready to start trying to take those first steps. If you have any sense in your head, you don't take that child out of the crib or the carriage or the chair and just say, okay, baby, today we're gonna walk and put them down and say, follow me. I mean, do you do that? <laughs> you take that child and you might put that child where? Right in front of you. Why do you put the child right in front of you? You, you put that child right in front of you so that you can watch them and if there is any danger of them falling and hurting themselves, you're right there too. That's it. And, and many situations, you might even encourage that child to walk, so you'll put them in front of you and you'll take their hands and you'll just hold them and start walking with them. Am I right? Do you realize that's what God was calling Abram to do? Friends, look at Isaiah 41 and verse 10. It's right there in our Bibles. Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10. You see what God, is, God called Abraham to experience, he's calling us to experience. And Isaiah 41 and verse 10, listen to the words of God. Fear thou not, for I am 
with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. <laughs> just like a parent holding up their child. Is it a, do you think it might be a scary thing for a child just to start? He says, don't be scared, mommy and daddy, they're right here with you. I'm your parent, I'm not going to, he says, I'm your God, I'm not just going to let you fall. I'm going to strengthen you because I'm almighty. You're having trouble doing this thing? Don't worry, I'll help you. And if there's danger of you falling, don't worry, I'll uphold you with my righteousness. Friends, we have a mighty God. We have a loving Father. <laughs> and he tells him to walk before him. Notice he says, don't fear. It can be a fearful thing for a child. It can be a scary thing for a child to be taking those first steps. They're venturing into new territory here. He tells Abram to walk before him. Not walk behind him, not on, side, on the side of him, but walk before him. If I'm walking side by side with an individual, I can see them in my peripheral vision. If I'm walking behind you, then I can definitely see you. I have a direct line of sight. But if I'm walking before you, I can't see you. The Bible told us in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. And because we're so used to living our lives based on what we can see, hear, and fear, feel, it's a fearful thing just to have to rely on the word. Isn't it? It's a fearful thing. Many times we tremble at it. Can I really trust? God says, don't fear. I'm with you. Some of us, unfortunately, are fearful to attempt to grow in the will of God. You know, the devil actually, <laughs> he puts fear in our hearts to actually attempt to move forward in the will of God sometimes. I can't tell you how many people, I mean, I don't know if this might have been your experience, I can't tell you how many people they know that there are things they need to separate from in their lives, vices that they're practicing right now that they need to cut loose from. And they say, you know, I need to stop this thing. And then the enemy comes and says, why would you even begin to try to attempt to do it when you know you're going to go right back to it tomorrow? Why would you attempt to do it? You're just going to. And he causes you to doubt and fear even to take the first step. And you say, you know what? Yeah, that's right. I'm just going to stay right here. And this is the reason why so many people believe it's impossible to experience perfection. They're taking their experiences and superimposing it on what God is calling us to experience. In other words, because they're not experiencing growth, they think it's an impossibility. Friends, in Christ all things are possible. And I love the fact, just pay attention to the word of God identifying that God calls Abram to have this experience with him when he's 90 years old and nine. He's 99 years old. This man walked on the face of planet Earth for 99 years, and a good deal of it, he was having a close relationship with the Lord from what we see in the Word of God, and yet he still had not learned to walk before the Lord. So can I say that many of us, when we're around, when we pass three score and ten and we're still here, we say, people say, oh, you know, you have good genetics. No, you have a good God. Because it may just be that God is still trying to teach you how to walk. Amen. Friends, there's one thing that I know. I've never seen a child just jump out of the crib and start running across the room. The day that I see that, I'm running in the opposite direction, I promise you. You with me right now? And I've never seen a child that was learning to walk that did not trip or stumble, trip or stumble in the process. Tripping and stumbling 
is not the problem. It's not getting up. That's the problem. Have you ever seen a parent be worried when their child, of course, they're worried about their child hurting themselves. But you ever see a, ch a parent angered that their baby that was learning to walk trip and, tripped and stumbled? I've never seen any conscientious parent get upset about that. What I've seen a conscientious parent get disturbed about is if their child, who is attempting to walk, tripped, stumbled, got on their knees and said, I'm not going to try this thing again. We're going to crawl this one out. We're just going to crawl for the days of our lives. Are you with me now? When that, when that child is still crawling two years old, three years old, that's when you start calling the doctors. Something is wrong. Something's wrong. Friends, you can't fall unless you're trying to walk. You're not walking into me. The just man falls seven times and does what? The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. It's a growth process. It's development. Let's talk about this development thing. We said another one of those definitions for the word perfection was ripe. Remember that? Go with me to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4 and verse 27. We're going to look at this concept of perfection from this point of scripture. Mark chapter 4 and verse 26. The Bible speaks of the kingdom of God. And we know that the kingdom of God currently is not something that we see visibly without. The kingdom of God is within. Amen? And the Bible says in Mark chapter 4 and verse 26, So is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and should rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up. And what does the Bible say next? He knoweth not how. Now, some of you here may be much more familiar with agriculture than I myself am. But one thing I know, and I've had enough opportunity to practice this, once again, I'm not claiming to be, <laughs> I'm not claiming to be the, the, the expert on this one. But I know if you put a seed in the ground, you can put it in the proper environment so that it can get sunlight and you water it, but I have never figured out how to make that seed grow. You're not with me right now. <laughs> Friends, you can water a seed, you can put it in the proper environment where it can get sunlight, but you don't know how a seed grows. The Bible says he knoweth not how. He says, I water it, I let sunlight in it, I come out every day, and one day I come out, and next thing I know, I see something coming out the ground. If, there's some, if something takes place, and, and you can't explain it, you can't fully comprehend it, what do you call that? Is it begins with an M. Another word. With an M. Miracle's a good one, though. It's, it is a miracle. A mystery. It's a... And this is talking about the mystery of godliness. How God can dwell in man. How the character of God can be reprodu reproduced in a human being. My friends, that is a mystery. It's just like when Jesus had his midnight interaction with Nicodemus. Nicodemus came with all of his good sayings to Jesus. And Jesus said, let's cut to the chase. You need to be born again. <laughs> Nicodemus said, what, what are you talking about? I need to be born again. Well, I'm supposed to go back into my mother's womb? And in verse 7 of the book of John chapter 3, Jesus said, marvel not that I said ye must be born again. The spirit, the wind rather, bloweth where it listed. You hear the sound thereof, but you cannot tell from whence it cometh or whither it goeth. Even so is everyone that is born of the spirit. It's a mystery. You know, many times we look at one act as the defining moment when Jesus came into our lives. 
And we don't even realize that before that happened, God was doing a whole lot of other work on us. The wind was blowing on us a long time. Before that moment, we surrendered. Look what it goes on to say. Mark chapter 4, verse 27. Look what it goes on to say. It then goes on to say, For the earth bringeth forth fruit of itself, first the blade, then the air, then the full corn in the air. I love this. Are we looking at development here, first of all? Yes, we are looking develop at the development of a crop and God is using the development of plant life as a direct symbol of the development of godliness in our lives. He says, first the blade, then the air, then the full corn in the air. Brothers and sisters, just think with me for a second. Let's just imagine, use your sanctified imagination that I have a corn seed in my hand and it has all of the genetic information in it that if I put it in the ground, give it sunlight, give it water, it will, it will grow into a full stalk of corn. Is that corn seed perfect or imperfect? What do you say? It's perfect. Why is it perfect? It's exactly what it's supposed to be in this present state. It's got all the encoding, all the information, put it in the right state, put it in the right conditions, it will grow. Okay, now you put it in the ground, water it, sunlight, come out one day, whoop, little, little blade pops up out of the ground. It's a little blade, it's green. You're too rough with it, it might. Is it perfect or imperfect? It's perfect. It's exactly what it's supposed to be at that phase of its development. And so on and so on. What the word of God is letting us know is that God expects of us that as we are in his will, at every state of our development, we can be perfect in the sight of God. Let's make it clear. You just came to Jesus. I mean, you were on the street doing all types of crazy, we can't even talk about it in the pulpit stuff. Right? And the Lord grabs a hold of you and you surrender your heart to Jesus. And he said, the first thing you need to give up is that sewage system of a mouth that you have. That's got to go immediately. Because I, I can't even, ha I can't have you disturbing my church with that one. You say, Lord, I surrender my tongue. Now, there's a whole lot of other stuff in your life that needs surrendering, but you surrendered your tongue. In that moment of time, you are perfect in the sight of God because you surrendered to him exactly what he called for you to give to him. You moved forward in the process of development that he asked for you to experience. He didn't ho he's not going to hoist it all on us at one time. He says, I need that mouth changed. Yes, Lord, I surrender. In the sight of God, if you were to die that day, you would be hidden in Jesus Christ. Just like the thief on the cross. You think the thief of the cross, if the thief on the cross was to live another 24 hours after that, you think he wouldn't have had some other things that needed to change? I can guarantee you he would have. But to dip but Jesus knew that man's heart. The decision he made that day, he would have continued to make every day after you're not with me right now. Okay, so fine. You give him your mouth. The next thing God says is, you know what? I need you to give up that music collection that you have. Give up the jazz, the rock, whatever that was. And you're like, Lord, it's hurt. I paid a lot of money for this. I don't want to be a bad steward. You know how we always got rationale. You know? Let me sell it. <laughs> sell it, Lord, and use it for mission work. So you're going to sell it so somebody else can go to hell and listen to it. No, you need to put that in the garbage. That's a write-off. <laughs> and you're like, you know what, Lord? Okay, I, I surrender. I, I, music in the garbage. There's other things that need changing. But in the sight of God, you're perfect. Then the Lord comes to you another day. Hmm. You need to give up that attitude. Uh, you need to give up that. Said, Lord, but that's who I am. Sometimes I got to give a people a piece of my mind. Ain't got no mind. Are you with me right now? 
And so you wrestle with the Lord on this thing and say, Lord, no, it's too hard. I can't just do that. And instead of surrendering, you make the decision to hold on to that, to that attitude. It is in that point in time that you have chosen to stop the development. Instead of growing, instead of advancing, you're now retarding. It's also called backsliding. Are you with me, friends? See, at every stage, we can be perfect in the sight of the Lord. Imagine a six-year-old in first grade, and the teacher goes to that six-year-old in first grade and says, I need you to do a calculus problem. It, the child doesn't even know the addition and multiplication tables, and you want them to do a calculus problem, and the child has no, can't do the calculus problem, and the teacher says, you're a horrible student. No, you're a horrible teacher. Friends, God is the master teacher. He's trying to lead us step by step by step in his will. He wants us to live a life of un uninterrupted victories. But it's only as we remain hidden in whom? Christ. I want you to see what the scripture goes on to say next. In verse 28 now, it says, but what? Verse 28, not 27. First the blade, then the air, then the full corn in the air. The very next verse now, it then goes on to say, but immediately he put it in the sickle. Why? Because the harvest has come. When the fruit is brought forth, that means when the fruit is fully what? Ripe. Does he wait? The word of God says immediately he'll put in the sickle because the harvest is come. Friends, do you know this is talking about Jesus' second coming? It's right here in the Bible. Go with me to the book of Revelation chapter 14. Look, at, look with me in your Bibles. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, and we're going to look at the 14th verse. Revelation chapter 14, looking at verse 14. The Bible says, and I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like unto the son of man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle and another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the crowd thrust in thy sickle and reap for the time has come for thee to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Who's the one that has the sickle? It's Jesus, the son of man. And when will he thrust in the sickle to reap? When the harvest of the earth is ripe. When is the harvest of the earth, ri earth ripe? When the character of God is perfectly reproduced in us. Now somebody here has heard of Christ object lessons before. Have you heard of that before? On page 69 we're told, when the character of God is perfectly reproduced in us, then will Christ come to claim his church. You can't tell me we don't have a prophet. The word of God said it. As soon as God sees his character perfectly reproduced in us, Jesus comes. Okay, one more scripture for this if you don't believe it. Look at the book of James. The book of James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Let's make this our last scripture for this evening. I want this to stay in our minds, friends. James chapter 5. Are we there together in the Bible? James, the fifth chapter... And I want you to begin with me, James 5, and let's look at uh, verse, James 5 and verse, I believe it is 17. James 5 and verse 7, rather. There it is. The Bible says, be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Listen to this now. Behold, the husband man waited for the precious fruit of the earth and have long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Now the early rain is the rain that begins the growth of the plant life. It begins the growth of the produce. 
The latter rain is what brings that plant life to full ripeness so that it is ready for harvesting. And the Bible tells us that the husbandman, who is Jesus Christ, he is patiently waiting for the fruit, which is us, to receive the early and the latter rain. Now tell me, does the fruit wait on the farmer or does the farmer wait on the fruit? So when we're saying, oh, when is Jesus going to come? He's looking at us and saying, when are you going to allow me to come? You think you're waiting on me? I'm waiting on you patiently because if I came now, you wouldn't be ready for the harvest. We have a merciful God. Let me tell you something. There's nothing like ripe fruit. <laughs> Listen, you go to the supermarket right now. I was there with my dear brother the other day. And I tell you, I'm very, spe I'm very skeptical, skeptical about mangoes in the supermarket. Very, I'm just going to tell you the truth. I'm skeptical. Very. I can't say that enough. Very. Especially those Walmart mangoes. Very. Why? They look good. They don't taste as good as they look. If you've ever been to the islands, if you've ever, my wife is from Jamaica. Oh, you know, if you know about Jamaicans, they love to go on and on about mangoes. It's like, it's almost, it's almost blasphemous to much, as much as they talk about mangoes. And, and you know, they say, they say the tree of life is going to have mangoes. You know, they go, they go this far with it. And I'll tell you, she tells me about the, dip, they have different types of mangoes. You know, and she always tells me, oh, the Julie mango, it's the best mango, it's the best. Oh. And I remember I went to Jamaica to do, to do a mission. <laughs> it was my first time. And when I arrived at my destination, the first thing the brethren asked me was, Brother Hudson, would you like a mango? I said, I said, I said yes. I said, you know what? Do you have a Julie mango? Because <laughs> my wife tells me all about these Julie mangoes. Do you have a Julie mango? They said, we do. And they went and they gave me one of these mangoes. Brethren, all I'm going to tell you is this. I ate so many mangoes on this trip. True story. I ate so many mangoes on this trip that I did not eat mangoes for another year thereafter. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> it was so tasty. Ripe fruit is amazing. Yeah. But when the fruit is not ripe, have you ever had, a, um, what's that interesting fruit again? It's orange. Comes out during the fall. Somebody should be helping me right now. You're not doing, any, you're not doing anything to help me. I'm not a mandarin. It's fall. It's a fall fruit, actually. You're doing nothing to help me right now. Persimmon. Thank you, my sister. May God bless you. Now, they have the big persimmons and they have the little ones. That are like, have you ever had a persimmon that was not ripe? It will turn your face inside out. Your face will implode. It, it, it sucks all. <laughs> you want to talk about something? Somebody here knows what I'm talking about. I see my brother nodding his head. It, it is the worst experience. Friends, fruit that is not ripe, it's no good. You know, bananas might look good when they're not ripe, but they don't taste good. God is, and a lot of us in the church, we look good. But we're not ready yet. Because if we were ready, Jesus would have come. He's waiting for the harvest to be ripe, patiently. And I love what he says next in verse 8. He says, be ye therefore patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Friends, God says, I'm being patient with you. I'm patiently waiting on you to receive the work of my spirit in your life so that my character can be perfectly reproduced in you so that you can be ready for the harvest. I'm patiently working and waiting on you and I need you to be patient with me. Because in the end, the Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. 
a people that patiently wait on the Lord. Be patient. God's working. Go through the process with him. And the work that he has begun in you, he will complete in you if you follow him. No. By faith, if you trust him to uphold you, if you believe that he can do all things in and through you. Last thought I want to share with you, and I close. It's a short one. Jesus said, be ye therefore perfect. I call that creative language. It's just like in Genesis chapter 1. He said, let there be light. God says, be ye therefore perfect. In other words, the Lord is calling for perfection to be in existence in our lives. It's the word of God. And the word of God, as we learned yesterday, it doesn't have creative power. It is creative power. God can accomplish the work of perfection in you if you embrace his word and believe it, with, believe it with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. There's a difference between, as Solomon called it in the book uh, Patriots and Prophets, Animate creation and inanimate creation. See, we're animate creation. We're intelligent creation. God has given us the ability to think, to reason. But let's say like a rock, for instance. That's what we would call inanimate creation. And inanimate creation has to immediately obey the will of God. If he says to the rock, move left, the, left, the rock will move left immediately. If he says to the sea, open up, it will split. Are you following so far? But if he says to you and I, be perfect, that same word has creative power to bring about the change in our lives, but we have something that the rock doesn't have, choice. We say, I heard your word, but let me think about it. I heard what you said, but we have a choice as to whether or not God's word will be fulfilled in our lives. Choose to accept God's word as truth in your hearts. Believe it, final scripture. Trust in the Lord with all thine hearts and lean not upon thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. May God bless you. Is that, is, your, is that your desire this evening to trust God with all of your heart? If it is, just raise your hand. Let's pray and ask God to fill up our decisions. Father in heaven, Lord, we want the latter rain. We want to receive the fullness of your spirit, both the early and the latter rain. These things you have made so plain in your word to us that we can obtain to being restored back into the image of you, the living God, if we simply give ourselves without reserve into the hands of Jesus. Please lead us to have a life of victory in Christ. Please fill us with the fullness of your presence. And then, Lord, please use us until Jesus comes to reap us from this earth. This is our prayer. We ask this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.